I know what y'all are thinking. Why is she here again? She was just here last week. Why do we have to listen to her again? I'm sorry, I'm back. Um, once again, I'm Nicole. In case you weren't here last week, I'm the vice president of White Hat. And this time, I will be talking about Dirty Cow. Um, so Dirty Cow is a privilege escalation attack that uses a vulnerability in the Linux kernel. Um, it's a really cool attack. Um, it's also decently simple compared to most attacks and vulnerabilities. So I'm hoping that you guys can all completely understand it by the end of this talk um, within like 15, 20 minutes. And that should be somewhat manageable. Let me know if you have any questions, because um, I'm going to try to go super into technical detail about all of the things, show you the actual code and everything. This is the steps to view the code if you want to do that. <coughs> cool. So first, a little bit of technical jargon. This is stuff that you will hear kind of generally, not just within the scope of this talk. So first is CVE. Um, this stands for Common Vulnerabilities and Exposures, and this is basically this compiled list of all of the um, publicly disclosed security vulnerabilities that we know about, or at least the ones that they wanted to compile. And so um, Dirty Cow is on this list, and it has some CVE number. I don't remember which one. It's like CVE 2016, because that's the year it was discovered, and then whatever the unique number is. Um, second, kernel. Um, most of you has probably heard this before if um, you've gotten anywhere like 357 or farther. Um, and it's basically the central part of your operating system. It's what does all of the things for you and um, helps you interact with like the hardware on your system and memory and all of that kind of stuff. Um, and then next, we have privilege escalation, which I kind of briefly mentioned earlier. And that's the kind of attack this is, um, which is basically a type of attack that gives you more privilege or like ability to do stuff in a system, not necessarily malicious stuff. Like um, root privilege is basically the highest level of privilege you can have on a computer, um, which is great if you want to do malicious stuff, but also great if you just want to run your computer. Um, and um, you need root privilege for a lot of really cool attacks. So that's why privilege escalation um, are usually paired with something else, which is like the actual like attack itself. Um, and cool next is cow. So that's part of the name of this attack. And cow stands for copy on write. And this is basically an operating system um, so an operating system does this to conserve resources because you don't actually need to copy the entire file if you just want to read from it. Um, so instead, what the operating system does is it just allows you to read directly from the file so it doesn't have to copy that entire chunk of, that entire chunk of data into your memory segment. Um, and only writes to, and only actually copies the file if you want to write to it because you um, don't necessarily want to be writing to the file on um, the original copy of the original file you want to write to a copy instead. Um, and next we have race condition. And um, this is another important thing for a lot of security stuff. Um, some cool secu security vulnerabilities take advantage of race conditions. And race conditions are basically when you have two processes that are executing at once that are usually that it's um, they're sharing resources and they are somehow affecting each other in weird and unexpected ways. Um, and so this vulnerability takes advantage of a race condition that I will go into later. Um, and last, dirty, which is the other half of the name for this vulnerability, dirty cow. And um, this is basically when you have a um, copy of the data. This is a common term used in caching. If you took 315, you'll remember this from caching. Um, and so if you have a copy of the data and then you do something to manipulate that copy, so say you have like a copy of this file and then you change one little block in the file, like one string in the file, um, then that copy is now dirty. It no longer is in sync with the original version of the file. Um, and um, this is also somewhat important for this vulnerability, which is why I'm talking about it. Any questions about jargon? Cool. Next up, a little bit of background about the vulnerability. It was discovered way back in October 2016, so about two years ago. And um, it was responsibly disco disclosed, which means that it was um, revealed to the software distributors and the people who could patch it before it was revealed to the common public. And this was especially important for this vulnerability because it was a relatively simple one to exploit. Um, and so if it had been revealed to the general public, it would have been really easy for a lot of people to just write up real quick scripts that would take advantage of this and start um, maliciously attacking people. And um, this was discovered by Phil Oster at Red Hat, which is 
a company that works on open source Linux distributions. Um, this is, like I said before, a vulnerability in the Linux kernel, so that's where it um, needed to be patched. And he actually discovered it and um, found it in an uh, HTTP packet, which means that someone actually used this exploit before it was patched. So it was actually found in the wild, which is kind of terrifying, because some vulnerabilities are just kind of like theoretical stuff. Um, and last, this info is taken from a lot of different places, but the main place I got it is this YouTube video here, um, and that's uh, Live Overflow. I don't know if you guys have heard of him, but he has awesome videos. Um, and it's uh, explaining Dirty Cow local root exploit and then the CV code for that, um, if anyone wants to look at the original video that I took most of this info from. Cool, so the exploit itself, this is the code. This is like the main like chunk of the code. Um, don't really expect you to understand this right now. I'm gonna go step by step through each of the blocks and tell you what each of the things does. Um, and the basics are is that it allows writing to a file that you don't have permissions to write to. So it allows you specifically to write to a root permission file. Cool. Um, so the exploit, this is kind of like the first little bit of the exploit code that's like setting up um, what we're actually going to do with the race condition and how we're actually going to uh, go about doing this attack. And so um, what this specific script does is it takes in um, two, and so this is just like one version of it that is just like a really easy way to see and run it yourself and like see how it works. Um, and so this one just takes two arguments as input, the file that you want to write to, um, which would be a root permissions file that you shouldn't be able to write to, but we will show you that you can, and then the thing you want to write to it. And so first thing you do is you open your target file in read-only mode, which is that O read-only, and then you call mmap. And mmap is a um, system call that's interesting and a little bit hard to understand, so I'm gonna try my best to explain it. Um, it basically creates a new mapped memory segment in your current process. So each process has this like chunk of memory, um, and it creates, uh, and it basically, so mmap, it's mapping this file um, to this chunk of memory, and so it's taking that chunk of memory and um, allocating this block, the size of the file that you tell it to map to, which is the file that you open that's read-only. Um, <coughs> and doesn't currently do anything with it. And if you just want to read, we'll actually just read from the original file, doesn't copy anything over. It's only if you write that it will copy the info, the data from the original file into your um, mmapped like, portion. Um, and then another few important things are when you call mmap, you set it to read only and you set it to map private. Those are really important for actually making this vulnerability work if you didn't this exploit would not work the way you intended. Um, and so this makes it actually copy on write. So otherwise, it would just um, read and write to the original file. Um, but because it's mapped private, that means that if you try to write to it, it's not going to write to the original file. It's going to write to your mmapped copy of the file. Um, cool. And this is a cute little diagram that I made to help you understand copy on write a little bit more, because it can kind of sometimes be confusing. So basically, you have your program. And if the program just wants to read, it calls read from that like mmapped memory segment. And it will just, um, and then the kernel will just go in and actually just read from the original file. Um, but then if you call write, it will take that original file, copy that little code section that you want to write to and like somewhat around that, and then copy that into your mmapped file and change whatever you wanted to change there. And so you're making a copy of the file inside that memory map segment when you want to write to it. All good so far. Any questions? Cool. I'm going to continue. So this is where we get our race condition. And like I said earlier, a race condition is when two processes, in this case, these two p-threads, um, interact in fun and unexpected ways. And so specifically this one, you have your mAdvise thread and your proc self mem thread. And those sound like nonsense right now, but I promise they will make sense eventually. Uh, so first you have your first thread, and this is mAdvise. And mAdvise is a system call um, where you tell the kernel what you're doing with this little block of memory. And so specifically, you're telling the kernel what you're doing with your mapped memory segment, just like the first thousand, uh, or no, first, 100 bytes, I believe, of this memory segment. And um, so this one 
is saying unadvised don't need. And that's really important because what that says is, hey, kernel, I don't actually need this memory segment. You can just throw it out, just like free all the things there. I don't need it anymore. I'm done with it. Um, and this is going to be important later when we actually bring it back into the race condition, but it just seems like a really weird thing that you're doing. You're just throwing away memory. Um, <clears throat> cool. And yeah, this is going to be key later, um, especially because here, when you throw away the memory, if you want to write to that again, you will have to reload from the original file. Um, so if you just kind of like left it there, then you could just keep writing to that um, memory mapped uh, section that you have some stuff loaded into. But then if you say mAdvise, don't need it, it throws it away. And if you want to write there again, it'll have to reload it from the original file each time you do that. And so the other thread, thread two that we have, is um, using, so first it's opening a file procself-mem. And procself-mem is not like a real file in like um, the real sense. It's basically a pseudo file that um, represents your current process memory. And so when you're uh, reading and writing to procself-mem, it means that you're reading and writing to your current process memory. And so this is, reading or writing to that mmapped segment of memory. And um, this, and so what this code does here is it basically, you, the resetting the file pointer isn't important. Basically what that's doing is it's writing to the copy of memory you have. So it's writing to that mmapped section. And um, that's all well and good. It's great to do that, that's fine. That's taking advantage of copy on write. It's super optimized and everything. But the problem is, is when you have the race condition with those two threads. And so normally this would execute fine. Um, you would try to write to that mmap section. It would make a copy from the original file into that section. You would write to it and then mAdvise, say, I don't need it, and then it would throw it away and then just keep doing that same thing over and over again. But for some reason, so the way this vulnerability works is it takes advantage of the fact that um, the write call doesn't, um, make sure that the mAdvise has completed. And so, or that it doesn't make sure that the, um, that the copy on write is like set up correctly. And so what happens is you try to write to the mapped file. And so it makes, it copies from the original file into the mapped file, but before you can actually write to it, it throws that away. So you're no longer looking at that, you're looking at the original file. And so eventually what you do is when you're trying to write to that copied piece of the file in your mmapped memory segment, um, it, that has been thrown away before you can write to it. And so the kernel's like, okay, then where do I write to? And it writes to the original file instead, which is how you actually, how this vulnerability works in the like, this is actually how it works is this race condition here where you've thrown away your mapped section and are instead writing to the original file. And so what does this actually mean? What are the implications? Um, so one thing that's also cool about this is this has existed in the Linux kernel for nine years. Um, that's a long time to, for a vulnerability to exist and not be kind of like known about. Um, and one thing that's also kind of funny about this is that it was actually a known issue. Um, uh, Linus Torvald found it um, nine years ago back when it first got introduced and tried to patch it, but was like, this is too much work and it's probably not actually gonna be a big deal. It's probably not gonna be exploited. I think it's fine and left it. And now we're back in the president. He's like, yeah, I was wrong. It's actually got exploited. And um, so the thing that actually made this, so originally it wasn't an actual like um, exploitable vulnerability. It's that over time, um, as systems got more and more efficient and systems got better, um, the uh, race condition actually became viable before it was just like a theoretical attack. And um, so this has been patched in operating systems. It's great, it got patched super quickly. And so all of our computers and um, the Linux servers and everything have this patch installed pretty much if they've been updated anytime since 2016. Um, but where this is actually still an issue is um, IoT and embedded devices. So IoT is Internet of Things, and those are like your like toaster that can like talk to the internet, or like your fridge that will like play music or play videos, that kind of thing. Those have very simple chips, and sometimes they don't allow updating the operating system. So if you bought one of those before 2016, they can actually still possibly be vulnerable to this attack. 
Um, another cool thing, like I said earlier, this was actually found in the wild by the guy who um, discovered it and disclosed it. Um, he found an HTTP packet with a variant of the dirty cow code, which is actually real neat. Um, one last thing is that this attack was exploited years later, so somewhat more recently um, with these new I don't know how you pronounce that, malware for Android. And that was actually really cool. And it, it affected more than 5,000 users, um, mostly users in China and India. And basically what it did is it was malware that was embedded into these apps that were sold not on the Google Play Store, but like on like sketchy websites. They were like adult apps that you like couldn't buy on the Google Store, obviously. And um, they had this malware embedded in it. And what it would do is it would um, use its root access to send money to the attackers through the cell carrier. Not 100% sure how all of that works, but um, it used that to do that and made some money, and it was a cool malware thing. Um, so mitigation, what can you do to prevent yourself from this? Um, you're probably already pretty much protected. This was two years ago. You're probably fine. Like I said, IoT embedded devices, maybe not fine. Um, Android, make sure you're updated. One crazy thing about the Android, though, is I think it's only KitKat version 4.4 and above um, is patched for this. And so if you have anything below that or anything that can't update past that, then you're just always going to be vulnerable to this. Um, so if you do have Android and you can't um, update past that version, then just make sure to download apps from the Google Play Store and like don't download them from like sketchy websites. Um, the Google Play Store does a lot of checking for malware and is generally pretty decent at it. Um, Corporate side, um, what can you do to prevent this kind of stuff from happening? Be proactive, not reactive. Um, like I said before, this was actually discovered. Um, and he was like, yeah, it's not going to be an issue. So patch all the bugs, especially bugs that you think could be possible security vulnerabilities. Um, and don't just try to secure for like current common day against like known exploits or things that you think can be exploited in the current day. Try to like think towards the future. and patch things that you think might become problems in the future. This is the big takeaway from this guy. Um, any questions? I know that was a lot of stuff. Yes? Um, embedded in IoT, um, if they run any type of, of Linux kernel, they tend to run embedded Linux. Mm -hmm. Does that kernel still have the same vulnerability, or is it different because it's not like a free distribution kind of thing? I believe so. I didn't see anything specific about like different kinds, but I'm pretty sure almost all of the Linux distributions were um, subject to this vulnerability. I, I, I don't want to ask questions that is taking away from uh, Steve, the... Steve, my dog's way too long to ask questions. <laughs> sure, I have a question. Yeah. So you said that this was discovered in an HTTP packet, as in like the code for this exploit was being sent and someone sniffed up the traffic, or someone was trying to exploit this over HTTP? Um, the code for the exploit, so I believe someone was trying to, I think it was actually an attack. I don't actually remember it. It was, um, so the guy who discovered the vulnerability, Phil Oster, was, um, he said that I, so I think he discovered the vulnerability and then also saw evidence of the attack in a packet that was sent to his website. Um, and so that was uh, trying to attack his website. I'm not sure about that, though. I would have to do more research. Yeah. <clears throat> just like, I wonder what, what normally uses EmmetBot? I don't know. Like web servers, I guess, maybe? Mm. Seems yeah. like a weird, I don't know. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know what version of the Linux kernel this was patched in? Um, I don't know off the top of my head, but it is online in one of my many references. Um, I think it's in do 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 that one, the Linux Foundation one. Um, not a hundred percent sure though. I can find that out for you if you really want to know. Um, I also know the command to run to see what Linux version you're running, and you can cross-reference that with the list of things. Copying and pasting is weird from PDFs to like normal text. Cool. Any other questions? If not, we can get on to the second talk of the day. Cool.
All righty. Yeah, so there's drop shadow because it's called foreshadow and it's funny. How great. Uh. All right. So um, <laughs> welcome to foreshadow. My name is Kylan. I am the president of White Hat. I am still sick. Um, first of all, a quick disclaimer. Um, I know that it's fall quarter, and I know these talks are supposed to be intro because that's one of my favorite parts of White Hat is that these all fall quarter talks, they're introductory. Um, but the vulnerability that I'm talking about is like super dense, but it's also the one that I'm talking about. Um, but like it should probably be fine. Um, but basically, like if you learn anything in this talk, like it's probably going to be something neat about computer architecture that you didn't know before. Um, if you already know computer architecture, you're probably going to learn something about a vulnerability, and that's great. Um, and maybe if you're like the smartest person ever, you'll learn both. But like, don't be scared if you only learn like one thing. Just like you're like, ah, oh, caches. I'll stick that in my back pocket for later when I take 315. It's going to be great. Um, so we're just going to try this out. Um, also, I'm sick. Um, this talk is dense. Um, I think that's it for disclaimers. So with that, let's get into the attack. So there were, so Foreshadow was discovered in January of this year by two separate research teams. So there's like these three different flavors. The first one is the Intel SGX Secure Enclave version, uh, which is like the one I'm going to be mostly talking about today. And the other one is Foreshadow NG, which stands for Next Generation. And that takes advantage of the operating system and VMs and hypervisors. Um, so you can execute this attack with no privileges at all, except for like being a user on this machine. Or you can have like some amount of privilege. Um, if you have root privilege, that obviously makes it way easier. But then why are you doing this in the first place? Who knows? Um, also, it has not been seen in the wild. Um, it is only a research. Um, like thing that happened. They told Intel in January and it was released to the public in August. So it's still like a super new vulnerability because we just learned about it like, what, two months ago, three months ago? I don't know. I don't know how long ago that was, August. Um, so let's look at like what foreshadow is. So like at its core, foreshadow uses speculative execution and clever uses of computer architecture to exploit the cache. And those highlighted parts are what you probably don't know. Um, and so hopefully, I will teach you something about at least one of those. Um, and we'll dig deeper into those. Um, not in order, because it actually wouldn't make sense to do it in that order, because um, you need some other stuff to understand the first thing. So let's start with that other stuff. We're going to talk about computer architecture. So um, computer architecture is basically like how computers do what they do. Um, it's like the way things are structured, and it's like kind of low level and like super scary, but uh, also like kind of weird. So I kind of just want to do like an overview of it because a lot of people haven't taken like 225 uh, or more likely 315 yet. Uh, 315 is computer architecture. Um, there's also like grad architecture and probably like other stuff if you're an EE or CPE or some other thing. Um, yeah, so there's other places you can learn about it like 315. Um, so first, the Intel SGX. Um, which is so, kind of sort of computer architecture, but it's also like kind of sort of hardware. Um, basically, it's this module that Intel has um, that's a secure enclave, which means that it's supposed to be like super safe, super locked down, super secure. It adds new assembly instructions, which are like very, they're like a step above machine code and like a step below C. Um, and they let you do things like inside the enclave. Um, and they also have like a super lockdown way to enter and exit the enclave. So like it'll like flush the entire cache, um, which we'll get into later. It'll like do a bunch of stuff, and it'll be like you can't do anything outside the enclave, or like you can't do anything inside the enclave um, unless you go through those specific entry and exit points. Um, and so this is like the thing that. Um, it's supposed to be super secure, and it has like a bunch of security features, but it's also the thing that is attacked by foreshadow. So, yeah. Um, next, we're going to talk about page tables. So, um, page tables allow you to map between like your virtual addresses and your physical addresses, because like in the physical addresses, you might have like stuff scattered all over the place, and like there's just data over here and there's data over here, um, but like you want your data together. And so you're just going to like pretend like the data is together, and that's what page tables are for. Um, they're kind of like a table of contents that points to another table of contents. So like each thing in the table of contents will point to a different table of contents. Um, so then like from that one, you could actually like find what you're looking for. Um, so yeah, they're all nice and together and 
it's great. Um, next, we're going to talk about pipelining. So pipelining is like this thing where you can utilize different parts of your computer. Because I don't know if you know this, but like computers have a lot of parts in them. So you can use different parts of them uh, to like multitask and like do one thing while a different thing is happening. So like you might like get an instruction while you're trying to figure out what this other instruction means, and you might be also doing that while executing a different instruction, and then also um, you might be doing all of that while also writing a thing to a different place, um, which is really cool. You use clock cycles to do it, and that's all weird and pipelining. Basically, you can do things while other things are happening, and that's going to be important later. Um, so a real life analogy of this is like you have this to-do list, right? And so you have to like do dishes, and you have to do laundry, and you have to vacuum. And so like uh, maybe you like start your laundry, but you don't want to wait like an hour for your laundry to be done before you can like make yourself some food, because that would like kind of suck. So um, you put your clothes in the like laundry machine and you like go make some food, you go do the dishes, when that's done, you put it in the dryer. Like you can do multiple things at once. You can have like multiple things on this list getting crossed off at once. Um, so that's basically the idea of pipelining, right? So like things are happening while other things are happening. Um, yeah. Does anybody have any questions on those computer architecture bits before I move on? Neato gang. All right, so uh, let's look at this gorgeous animation again, because all I did was copy this slide. Um, so next, we're going to talk about speculative execution. So speculative execution basically is like an optimization that you can do. And it, it makes the computer perform something, do something uh, that might not be needed. And then um, if it turns out that it wasn't needed, you'll just be like, never mind. I Never mind about that. Um, and the thing is, with speculative execution, it's basically pipelining. Um, with speculative execution, um, the thing was bad that you did in the meantime. Uh, so the real life analogy, uh, similar to the pipeline example, is imagine you have like the same to-do list, but this time you have an evil Roomba. And your Roomba wants your passwords. And so uh, you like set the Roomba to go, and it will like vacuum. But it'll also like send your plain passwords in plain text, because like, oh, well, I'm stuck under this chair. I guess I'll just do this other thing. Um, and you're like, no, Roomba, why'd you do that? And it's like, sorry. Um, so that would be an example of how like you could use this whole pipelining idea of doing something while you're doing something else um, to uh, have a bad consequence. And like you might try to throw that thing away and be like, hey, I didn't mean to send you those passwords. Ignore it. But then if the thing is bad, it'll be like, no. <laughs> um, so let me make sure that I got everything um, done with this. Oh, another thing um, would be like, another failure of this system would be like, oh, I'm going to do my dishes, and then I'm going to make food. But that's going to make more dishes. And so like, you basically just chose the wrong thing to do, and you did it. And that was like, it's kind of sort of analogous to another form of speculative execution. So yeah, that's also bad. So third time for the slide, for the last time. So does anybody have any questions on speculative execution and like that concept? Yeah. Wait, what was the thing about the dishes? Um, so basically, like. Uh, part of speculative execution is that you might do something that wasn't needed. Um, you might like, uh, basically in the pipelining version, uh, like the computer-y version, you would um, like load some instructions uh, before you actually know if they're the instructions you want to do next. Um, and then you would like start executing those, but maybe you're like, oh, never mind. I didn't want to do this thing. I want to do this other thing. Um, so that's like that. Oh, so like through a branch. Yeah, basically. Oh, okay. If you have like, you're like, oh, if this, this, otherwise do this other thing. And you're like, well, this if will probably be true. So I'll just do this other stuff first. And like, it'll probably work out. And then it doesn't work out. And so you did bad things when you should have been doing something else because it preloaded the bad things. Yeah. So anybody have any other questions about bad to-do lists and speculative execution and pipelining? Cool. So the next thing I'm going to teach is caches. And so um, <laughs> there's an analogy uh, that Nick uses to teach caches that I actually really like. So um, 
You might be cooking at your kitchen and in your kitchen you have like a spice rack and it might look like this or it might look like a normal spice rack where it's just like above your like pots and pans. Um, and so you're gonna be like cooking something and you're like, oh, I'll take the salt and I'll do this and I'll take like this other spice that I use all the time and I'll do this. Oh, but I want a different spice and it's not on my spice rack, but I know I own it. So I'm gonna go all the way over to my pantry and I'll be like, where's the spice? And I'll be like, where's the spice? And then I'll find the spice and I'll run all the way back so my food doesn't burn and then I'll use that spice. Um, and so maybe after I do that enough times for that spice, I'm like, actually, I think I should just have this in my spice rack because I use, you know, like paprika all the time, but I never use cumin. So I'm gonna stick it in my spice rack and trade it out. So um, that's sort of the idea of caches, where um, you don't want to keep going all the way back to main memory, because main memory is like so far away, and it's so hard to get there. So instead, I'm just going to like keep it in my cache, which is real nice and close and easy to get to. So um, it gives you some really nice properties, where um, you have like all these performance increases, um, because everything is so much closer together. Um, and it's like like easier to get to, and it's not far away like main memory. And you, you, you have the things that you use most often, um, or most recently, depending on how you've implemented your cache. Um, you have those like with you all the time. Um, if the, the cache gets emptied, like if I were like, I don't need this spice rack anymore, I want to walk over to my pantry all the time, um, and I put all my spices back in the pantry, it would take me like a super long time to refill the spice rack. So that would be the idea of like flushing a cache, where you're like, uh, I'm going to get rid of all the data here because it shouldn't be here anymore. Um, and so I'll just put it all away and then reloading it takes some time, but it also gets rid of uh, whatever data was stored uh, closer. So if you're trying to store secret data in your cache um, and then you're like, ooh, I don't want to store this here anymore because I'm not going to be safe for like after I leave this place, I'm just going to flush it all out. Um, that's the idea of like flushing a cache that the Intel SGX uses. So. Does anyone have any questions about caches? Awesome, cool. So we're gonna get into the actual attack. So now that I've just like sprayed out all the fire hose of the data um, and the information about computer architecture at you, we're gonna go onto the actual attack and we're gonna sort of put all that stuff together and make a shadow. So this attack has three phases. And so the first phase is caching Enclave secrets. And if you're wondering about the picture, that's a Buick Enclave um, that has literally nothing else to do with this entire talk. Um, so it is also casting a shadow. That's true. Um, so one of the important parts of this attack is that the, uh, and this is from like the research, one of the research papers that uh, foreshadow uh, is um, basically Enclave secrets, so the secrets that are inside the enclave, are always plain text inside the cache. So if you use a secret and it gets put in your cache, it's going to be in plain text. Which, like, you might think, oh my god, that sounds so awful and horrible. And like from a security standpoint, it is. But from a performance standpoint, it takes so much work to encrypt and decrypt data um, that that would be like a huge performance decrease and would basically just like why would you put it in the cache in the first place? Because it's going to take so long to get. So they're always plain text inside the cache. So what are the two ways that we can get the information into the cache in the first place? Because we need it in the cache in order to get it out of the cache. Um, well, the first way is to like wait until a user basically uses a secret and it gets put in the cache. That's one way to do it. Um, if we are a privileged user, we can also basically force the Enclave to put the secrets into the cache, even if we can't see them, um, by doing some weird assembly stuff. Um, you don't have to be a root user in order to execute this attack, like I said earlier. So um, you could also just wait. Um, yeah, so that's getting secrets into the cache. So the first step, we got the secrets, they're in the cache. Next step, we're going to do transient or speculative execution and determine the address of the secret. So we talked about page tables earlier, and those page tables are sort of used in the cache. And so the secure enclave puts this protection on the page table that stores the data for the secret and says, you're not allowed to get anything from here. So uh, instead of like failing immediately and being like, no, you're not allowed here, it's just going to send you a one. Because bits can be 0 or 1. It's just going to be like 1. And so like you might be like, hey, what's the secret? It's just like 1. 
just one. Um, and so it's not going to be a random bit. It's not going to be the secret. It's always going to be a one. And like you just won't know if the bit was a one or a zero. Um, and we can't like remove those protections because Intel was smarter than that. Um, but we can change it instead to basically be like, hey, uh, this page just isn't here. Like it's gone now. Um, and so we change the protections on the page table uh, so that instead of just returning a one silently and like failing silently like that, it will be like, no, you can't be here. The page table's not found. Uh, it's not here. It's gone. Um, instead of being unable to access it, it'll be like, it's not here. So um, then we're going to use speculative code execution to, uh, in varying ways. Um, they didn't actually release the code for this vulnerability, so it's hard to say exactly what type of speculative execution they used. Um, and we're going to uh, basically like go into the page table and try to get the secret. And so instead of returning a one, it'll take a second and be like, let me check on the protections for that. No, sorry, it's not here. But in the meantime, we'll be, do, we'll be you know, loading, those, uh, loading the code like we did in pipelining. And we're going to, by doing that, we're going to determine the address of the secret, because that's what's stored in the page tables, like the address. Like I said, table of contents to a table of contents. Yeah, modifying protections. That was like one of the coolest parts for me of this whole vulnerability. I was like, that's so neat. Uh, so the last phase is receiving the secret. So um, our hardware is going to get super, super angry at us. It's going to be like, why'd you go here? You can't be here. This place doesn't even exist. Um, and it'll kick you out. But in the time that it takes to do that, we can really, really, really carefully time the processor. Um, it's like, you know, up to like the tiny, tiniest clock cycle um, and be like, yo, what's this bit? Foreshadow gets stuff like really, really slowly, and it's not really viable in the wild right now, we think. Um, but yeah, it'll get stuff like, like one tiny, tiny chunk at a time because it goes through this process, and it just is like, I'm going to time this process to see like, if the secret is like a one or a zero. Um, so that's, like, that's, that's that. It's going to be angry at you, but instead of just returning a one, it'll be like, you can't be here. And that takes longer to say than one. Good with receiving the secret? OK. So I am now going to attempt something. Can I like do, oh, oh, mm, mm, OK, sure. Um, this is like the video they released with the attack, which basically shows foreshadow in action. So um, basically, um, it's going to, oh, that's bad. OK. Um, <laughs> we're just going to ignore that for now. Um, uh, we're going to say, like, hey, look, here's the secret. We're going to try to read from this memory. And so you can see that it returns FF, and in hexadecimal X, FF is just all ones. So we're trying to read from the page table right now. And um, it's the enclave memory and the abort page, which is basically just return ones, um, will return FF. So we can watch it return FF, and it'll just keep doing that forever. And we'll be sad, because we'll be like, oh, but I wanted the secret there. And then uh, for the actual attack, um, since we're using speculative execution, <coughs> we can uh, basically uh, read what's in memory. So over on one side, you'll see the hex dump. And on the other side, you'll see like the words that are actually stored in the enclave, which is super cool. So you can just watch as foreshadow does its thing. Um, and so yeah, they didn't release the code, but they did release this cool video. So I don't have cool code snippets to show you. Um, instead, you get, wait for it, foreshadow inside. Because it's like Intel inside, but instead of Intel, it's foreshadow. It's also like the Big Brother stuff. Cool. So let's reopen Keynote. <laughs> Don't want to do that. That's why I'm opening Keynote and not Keychain Access. We're going to open Foreshadow. And we're going to play. And I believe I'm still screen recording. And this is still going to do this thing. And so we're going to show Navigator, and I'm just going to click on the slide I was at. So does anyone have any questions about like foreshadow right now? 
I like it's fine if you are like I don't I'm so lost I have no questions because that's me like 90% of the time. Uh, okay. Yes. Can you go over again <clears throat> how it actually gets the secret? I kind of feel like I understand like the like underlying things but not how it kind of comes together. Yeah. So first of all, it does this page table thing, and it's like, it's like, hey, this table of contents to a table of contents. Tell me where the things are, and it'll be like, yeah. And so it'll tell you where the things are, and then you'll time the processor. Like it'll tell you where the secret is. Is what I mean when I say that. I'm still sick. Um, so it'll. It's like page tables point to addresses. Mm -hmm. Wait, wait. I can do this. Page tables. Page tables. Page, t oh, page tables? Page tables. So they point to addresses. They're addresses that point to addresses. So like over on one, I'm going to go past the applesauce. I'm sorry. Um, on one side, it'll have like these virtual addresses. And then it'll point to a physical address. And so like it'll point, like this doesn't store the secret. This stuff over here, like on this side, stores the secret. So it'll be like, oh, over here. That's where the secret is. So you go from there. I'm just going to show Navigator because I don't want to click through all those slides again. Oh, actually, no. I want to be here. Yeah. So then um, uh, you speculatively execute. Um, so you pipeline through the stuff, the code. And then um, uh, you're like, hey, so give me the stuff at this physical address and then like go from there. Um, and so you basically load all those things before the hardware is like, you can't be here because it doesn't exist. Um, so you're just reading from memory before the processor knows that you're reading from memory. Yeah. Yeah? Cool. All right. So next, we're going to talk about the implications of foreshadow. Oh, please don't quit again. OK. I got the like spinning wheel. Anyway, so what are the affected Intel processors? Please don't read this slide. I want you to keep your eyes uh, because there's a lot of things here and they're really small. <laughs> so like, this is a lot of Intel processors. And when you think of like how many computers each one of these is, like each one of these is not one computer, right? Like each one is like in like a lot of computers, like a lot, a lot of computers because a lot of things run Intel. Um, so. That's probably bad. Um, like, you know, Apple computers, for example, and like Microsoft too, right? Like, I think they all run Intel. So, like, pretty much everyone in here probably has an Intel processor, unless you're like really cool and you're like, I want this other thing. So, that's bad. Um, so, here's a little bit of backstory for uh, sort of why foreshadow is like even bad because you might be like well it's never even like seen in the wild like it's only like this weird research thing and it was patched like like before august so um some backstory would be meltdown inspector um like late 2017 early 2018 ish uh two kind of similar exploits came out they were called meltdown inspector um meltdown allowed you to <coughs> sorry meltdown allowed you to read memory for things you weren't supposed to because of one kind of speculative execution called out of order execution and also exceptions. Uh, and then Spectre uses branch prediction, um, which like get it because it's Spectre because speculative execution and it's holding a branch because branch prediction. Anyway, um, and they both use those like techniques of speculative execution. Um, and they affected also like a ton of computers. Um, and it's really hard to mitigate against because they use like they utilize these performance increases that we've built into hardware, like pipelining, uh, in order to exploit stuff. So um, that's the same general idea behind foreshadow is this whole speculative execution thing with like some other cool stuff sprinkled on top. Um, but because of that, uh, like it's really like bad. So. Um, because of Spectre, Meltdown, and now Foreshadow, we're seeing a lot of products whose hardware and like the more low-level stuff, like those performance increases, are getting targeted by attackers. Uh, so like, like you have to remember there are some parts, some Intel parts that you cannot, you literally cannot remove from your computer without bricking your device. Like you just can't. Like it won't work anymore. 
Um, so this is like a really hard problem to solve, uh, especially when a lot of their solutions might just be like, I guess you just like get a new computer, sorry. Um, so uh, it has like these really big implications for like, what do we do about pipelining to make it safer? Um, but also it might have no implications because nothing might get done of it. We'll see. Um, so what are some solutions uh, like Spectre, Meltdown, and Foreshadow? Um, also, I'm not an expert on Spectre and Meltdown. Uh, there's a, one of the lost talks was given by Nick about Spectre and Meltdown. Sorry, Nick. There you go. Um, yeah. So uh, first of all, one solution would be update all your things. Uh, like Nicole said, like updating stuff is probably one of the best ways to uh, like keep everything up to date. Um, the best way to mitigate security concerns, I just said updating is the best way to keep things up to date. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it's like, if you've ever read like security notes for updates, you might be like, hmm, core crypto is broken. That's probably bad. I should definitely update. Um, so yeah, just like update your stuff. It's literally the best possible solution, no matter who you are. Keep everything up to date like all the time. It's great. Um, but like, if you're like really, really worried, because like Spectre and like Meltdown and like Foreshadow probably won't actually like leave any trace on your, well, I don't know about Meltdown, but like Spectre won't necessarily leave a trace on your device and neither will Foreshadow um, for the most part, but you know. Um, like it's, if you're really concerned, you might just want to get a new computer. Um, like for Meltdown, it's not too bad because uh, it's, the things that broke was mostly like software stuff. Uh, but for Spectre and also for Foreshadow, um, it's a lot harder to solve with just software updates. And like updates are obviously still like very useful, and they will solve most of these problems. But um, some of Intel's solutions were like, I guess, computer new one, um, and that's really scary. Like that's a scary thing to have happen when like the best solution to a problem is like buy a new thing because this one's broken. Um, uh, there are some architectures that allow you to sort of bypass Intel, but they aren't really like commonly available in things that we use today. They aren't like mainstream yet. So like if you want to be a hipster about it, like by all means use like RISC-V. Uh, <laughs> but like for now, just continue to use Intel, I guess, because it's hard not to. Like I said, they're in Mac computers, they're in Microsoft computers. And so like updating stuff is still definitely the best way to stay safe. Uh, so with that, does anybody have any questions? Cool. I'm, yes. We talked a little bit about brand prediction. How do you like predict which, which like way your code is going to go for that? And would you be able to like avoid malicious attacks by like not predicting that thing that so um, there's like two questions in there. So the first one is, how do you decide where to branch to? The second one is, can you avoid malicious code? The answer to the second question is no, because you're a computer. You don't really know what's coming next. The best way to avoid malicious code would just be to like eliminate branch prediction, um, because you might branch to somewhere bad, and you just don't know. Um, but the first question, um, there's sort of two ways of doing it, from what I understand. Uh, you either do it a naive way, and you're like, uh, you're like, if, like, something, thing, uh, and then just, like, stuff. So the naive way to do it would be, like, I'm probably going to take this, and then just do thing, uh, and preload thing. Um, that's sort of the naive way to do it. Um, it's just, like, pick one and load it, because um, you, you don't know. Um, but if you are sort of like smarter about it um, and you have something that looks like uh, for, uh, this is just pseudocode, so. so for i between 0 and 100 stuff uh, and then other stuff. If you're like doing this one 100 times, at some point you're going to be like, I've been doing this one a lot. I'm going to load this one because I am doing it a lot. So it's probably going to happen next. 
And then for like 99 times out of 100, that's going to work perfectly. Um, but for like this one, it's going to be like, oops, wasn't supposed to load that one. I'll just throw that one away and do this. So there's like dynamic branch allocation and static branch uh, prediction, something like that. Something along those lines. Static and dynamic sound correct. <laughs> Is that right? Yeah. 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 It uses a different, um, you can predict based off of how often you take that branch, um, which can be done in a really simplistic manner, like just a two-bit select where you strongly take it or you weakly take it. Um, or you can get more and more complex with that branch table. Yep. So yeah, that's branch prediction. Um, and yeah, as far as I know, the only way to avoid malicious code is to not have malicious code in any of your branches, or like, just don't predict your branches, which makes stuff a lot slower. But um, Intel released a bunch of documents about foreshadow, and one of the ones they had was about their mitigations and the performance impacts they had. Um, and honestly, like, they're like not impacting performance at all. Like, the updates are like, like the bar charts are like, you know, 99.8% of something, and then like 99.7%, and they're like all the same except for like really big servers where it's like, yeah, there was more of a performance decrease here, but like even the updates they had um, kept a lot of that performance from pipelining and stuff. Also, like, you're probably utilizing like 30% of your CPU at any given time, so it's probably better that you lose some of that performance and yeah. not be exploited. Yeah. Parts of your processes spend most of their time blocked. Yeah. <clears throat> no, that's me at work. Does anyone have any other questions? Like, it's after 7. You can just, like, leave if you want. But if anyone wants to, like, talk about vulnerabilities, like, I can talk about this one. I can't talk about Dirty Cow, sorry. <laughs> Thanks for coming. <laughs>